Our next speaker, Nathan Cutts, is the Yasuko Endo and Robert Bowles Professor of Applied Mathematics at the University of Washington. Okay, hi guys. Uh, I hope, I wish we could all be in person. <laughs> we almost pulled it off by this summer, but I guess we're gonna push it out a little longer. Um, so thank the organizers. I think this has been a fantastic conference. Really enjoyed uh, learning some interesting ways to do modeling and biology this morning. And uh, um, what I'm gonna be talking about, and it's it's great to follow George, because I think there's so much uh, great work George is doing around pins and this deep O-net. And uh, you know, what, what we're trying to do as well is thinking about how do we build physics into sort of this these neural network architectures. And I'm going to talk about work here. My main colleague is Steve Brunton here at the University of Washington. And mostly what I'm going to be featuring is uh, work by our students. We have a fantastic group of students and postdocs, and you'll see them throughout uh, in some of the work that they are doing. Um, I'm going to really focus on this kind of architecture here, uh, really the way we're kind of building towards some things. And, and I think you know, one of the things that you see highlighted in George's work as well and in, in others is that, you know, starting to set up architectures that you can leverage to your advantage is really some of the key goals of what you have in mind when you do some of this deep learning, right? It's not just throw everything into some neural network and put output, but really like, can I put structure in there so that uh, I could take advantage of some things? And so, what we're going to do is targeted use of neural nets, and we're really separating this almost like what we've had success with in, in a lot of PDEs, which is almost a separation of variables type architecture, right? Which is we're going to take input data, and our first goal is to learn coordinate transformations so that we can somehow take advantage of a representation of the dynamics. So that's going to be the entire talk in some sense is, is what are the kind of ways we might be able to do some of these things and what kind of, uh, what kind of things can we train towards? So, uh, you know, for us, the discovery paradigm are things like this. Uh, this is just a, a cartoon of what we might want to do, which is this is celestial mechanics. And what does it mean to discover this coordinate and dynamic pairing? Well, think about observations from Earth of a planet. And, you know, we originally had uh, the Ptolemaic system, which is, you know, one representation is this theory where it's circles on circles. And what we'd really like to do is take this data as the input. In other words, our visualization of the night sky, of the retrograde motion of Mars or Saturn or Jupiter or any of the planets, and learn that, in fact, there is a coordinate system in which if we make a transformation to the heliocentric coordinate system, then things come out to be these very beautiful elliptical orbits, right? So this is uh, this is this transformation that happened when we uh, from Galileo and Kepler Copernicus, and within that coordinate system, then finally we can write down really one of the most transformative laws uh, of humankind, which is a sort of our inverse uh, square law for gravity. Uh, and so with that F equals ma type physics, right? We can actually do amazing things, including doing things that are extrapolatory in nature, which is once you have this law, so that's kind of really what I want to go after is getting down to governing equations, because with that, then you can think about like, hey, could we launch somebody to the moon? In fact, we can, and we did. And it was because we had this governing equation that really allowed us to make that, that jump into an extrapolatory jump. We didn't have any data, right? We didn't have observations of people going to the moon. We had to actually extrapolate that from that physical law. So here's the mathematical framework of what we want to do is we want to think about taking measurements of a system. So Y of K, T of K. Uh, and so, you know, when you measure something, you're not necessarily measuring the state space. You're measuring whatever your sensor measures. And so I think George made a nice uh, comment there, which is, you know, part of where we're sort of going to is how much can I just video tape a physics phenomena and build a model directly from video, right? That's kind of a fantastic way to start thinking about new physics. Uh, the real, I think the real hero in all of this machine learning and rise of machine learning is the sensors that we have. Like, you know, here's this phone that I've got, I got HD cameras on front and back. I, you know, we have amazing ability in the sensor arrays that are available to us today. And that's actually very much part of the transformative story is our ability to work over here with collecting amazing amounts of data high quality data and we're improving this all the time and this is really what's revolutionizing our ability to do interesting things and by the way you know even for self-driving cars it's 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 this 
LIDAR technology, like measurements there that are allowing, you know, the, the kind of key measurements that they can be used to build self-driving cars. So I take measurements. It's not necessarily the state space, but I want to, in some sense, infer all of this. I want to be able to infer what would be the right state space representation, what is the right dynamics, and how do I parametrize it? Um, and so the goal is to, from measurements alone, build out this entire architecture, which of course, this is an ill-posed problem. And so, you know, normally I, I always like to say that in grad school, when we were, when, when a problem was ill-posed, you would just sort of say, well, I can't solve it. So I go somewhere else and solve something that's well-posed. But really the one thing that's really interesting about sort of the machine learning and statistical structure formulations of this is you say, if it's ill-posed, well, put enough regularizers on this or enough constraints and you can make it well-posed. And so I'm going to talk about the constraints or the regularizations we're going to enforce on this to make it well posed. And a lot of those constraints and regularizations are going to be based out of thinking about physics models. The first place I want to start was with linearizing transforms. So a lot of people have heard of Koopman operators dynamic mode decomposition. So this is about taking the data and building linear models. And, you know, it's, you know, the cartoon of it is in this simple example right here, which is here's a nonlinear two by two ODE, you know, you find this in the back of a simple differential equations book. The point about this model is when I have this, I could make a transformation into a new coordinate system where this is linear and there's constraints under one, what this can happen. But this is kind of the idea is like, can I find some subspace where if I warp this into a coordinate system, I make things linear. And that's, the, that's kind of really been the driving focus of Koopman theory, which has some really deep um, mathematical foundations that have been laid down, for instance, by um, Mesich and others. So for us, we're going to learn this coordinate transformation because you can't often guess these or write them down easily by using something like autoencoders. This is work with Bethany Lush in which we take an input space and we map it to a new latent representation. And what your goal is in this new space. So this is the coordinate transformation. I want to transform to a coordinate where the dynamics itself is linear. And so this allows you to start thinking about warping coordinates to make this happen. And so Bethany was able to do this and train these neural nets. And by the way, everything here is open source code, all the data is available. And so for instance, something like flow around a cylinder, which is sort of a simple example at the end of the day, but during this von Karman's vortex shedding behavior of, uh, be, of what happened behind the cylinder, cylinder, you know, this is some nonlinear dynamical system. It's a Hoff-like bifurcation. Uh, back there. It's, it's a little more nuanced and subtle than that. But the idea is that you can train this thing so that this thing gets warped into a coordinate system where that neural network, it has one responsibility, find a coordinate system to turn this into a linear dynamics. And in fact, that's exactly what this can do. Uh, so we're very pleased with this kind of ability to do it. And we generalize this structure to more complex neural network architectures where one of the things we wanted to encode is a near identity transformation. Because often between time steps, if you look at all our time steppers that we built over time, you know, like even the Euler step, the solution in the future is what it is now, plus a little bit of contribution from something, right? And so we build Runga Kutta schemes around this. But one way to think about it, it's a near identity transform. It's a perturbation away from what I currently have. So part of what we did here, this is work with Craig Jinn, is to build a linearizing transformation by using a, more sophisticated neural network architecture, but transforming it into a linear co a coordinate system where PDE dynamics become linear. And amazingly, what Craig was able to do is even linearize something as complicated as the kuramoto shivashinsky model, which exhibits a lot of spatial temporal uh, complexity and chaos. And even this model with its behavior, you know, we knew we could like linearize something like the Burgers equation because we knew that, you know, we can do that through the Cole Hoff and we can do that here. But even something like Kuramoto Shivashinsky can do this. And in fact, here's the exact solutions for full PD simulations. Here's what this trained neural network, which provides you a linear operator. So going back to the language George talked about, right? So deep O net is a much more general framework really for learning operators. And this is a very specific, like, let's constrain it to a linear operator. And this, in fact, I put all the pressure on the neural network to learn that coordinate mapping. And so it can do that very nicely here and produce some, some, some nice results. So, and this is all now linear dynamics in this new coordinate system. 
You can also instead warp time, and this is work with Henning Longa. So if you think about just time series data, you can you can do the same kind of thing. You can take things that are, you know, have complex temporal behavior uh, that persists for a long time, and you can say like, what if I find a transformation? So I could always do a Fourier transform of a time series, but of course it's, you know, generically for things that are like this, it's gonna require me a lot of Fourier modes. But what if instead I learn a neural network that takes some time series and tries to warp it into really nice sinusoidal functions? So I'm gonna learn a pairing of sinusoidal functions in a coordinate system that does this. And what this is allows you to do is it gives you a model which is ideal for long range forecasting because sines and cosines are really stable when you go to infinity. They don't blow up on you, they don't go to zero. So it provides a very natural framework for forecasting and is very accurate. In fact, if you, if, you, if you apply this, it's much more accurate than your standard LSTMs, RNNs, grooves. We compared it against everything. And the accuracy here on this, using this Fourier-based method with this learned transformation is, is quite remarkable. So, so not, you know, deep neural nets don't beat everything. If you, if you use some information in it, it actually really helps the performance. And here the information we're using is that we can find a basis that works really well, but we find that basis through a neural network transformation. It's ideal for doing things like reduced order models, right? So here's, here's a PDE simulation. What we do with this is we can take this simulation, we can look at some low rank embedding subspace, which is done by SVD. So these POD modes, now we can, we can look at the time series of what those modes do and warp them into sinusoidal functions. And so now what we have is a model that allows us to do these forecasts and predictions. In fact, this here is a prediction of the future state. You get a stable model and you can run this thing way out to the future. It's, it's actually the training cost is very low and it gives you a very nice way to think about um, reduced order modeling when you use this forecasting trick on your time, on your time component in this subspace. Final thing here around these linearizing transformations, you can also build Green's function. So the idea here is, this is a boundary value problem where the idea is, you know, deep uh, green functions have been used, of course, historically for a long time. In fact, I have a bunch of books back here. So if you have linear problems, you can in electromagnetics and heat equations, uh, uh, you know, uh, quantum mechanics, you know, you can find these fundamental solutions. But of course, we don't use them so much today because we're solving nonlinear problems. What this does is says, well, take my problem make it linear, take the forcing and pair that. So you learn two neural network architectures, a forcing and a representation of the function. And what I wanna do is put this in a space where linear superposition holds, because once I've done that, I can build the Green's function there. And this allows us then to construct fundamental solutions. Another way to say it is we've built Green's functions for nonlinear PDEs using this kind of architecture. It's all about learning a coordinate system that allows you to do linear superposition, which is the fundamental basis for constructing Green's function solutions. We can also learn governing equations. So again, how do I pair a coordinate system with governing equations? I'm gonna relax the restriction of there being a linear operator there and just say, find me some parsimonious governing equations. This is this idea of uh, Cindy, which is the sparse identification of nonlinear dynamics. This is nothing more than AX equal to B. So you just regress, find your sparsity pattern on a library of possible right-hand side functions. And so you can discover from time series data, what was the dynamical system that produced that data, okay? Uh, and so you can change this around to model PDEs. And some of this is older, but I wanna show you the, how we're using this in modern neural network architectures, right? So we can do it with PDEs, we can also do it with an evasion formulation. So instead of just doing sparse regression, we can actually do this using spike and slab priors. So what you get now is a way to do uh, an uncertainty quantification, get a, a sort of a Bayesian approach to this, which gives you these uh, PDFs for the loading coefficients. So now you have a, a probabilistic model discovery versus just uh, a more deterministic. This, by the way, turns out to be amazing for handling noise. And for, uh, and for stabilizing model selection. So it's a little bit expensive, but, uh, but it's, it's, again, it's a nice framework which really gets you around small amounts of noise with lot, the small, small amounts of data with lots of noise. This can actually handle it quite well. 
So we finally, finally can use these concepts here in this data-driven discovery piece to do something very similar we did in the linearizing transformations, which is, this is work with Kathleen Champion. What we were trying to think about is doing is, how do we pair where I started coordinates and dynamics discovery jointly? So I wanna take in some measurement space learn a coordinate transformation where there's the dynamics and the dynamics here i'm going to now impose this cindy architecture in the middle so i want a coordinate system that allows me a parsimonious representation which can be nonlinear, of the dynamics now why the reason i'm so excited about this work is it can start to handle a model like this what i'm giving you and this again uh george uses distant architectures but we're both after kind of trying to get after the same thing which is Suppose this is my experimental data, it's a video, right? And the video doesn't tell me that, oh, there's a pendulum there and the right coordinate system is a theta theta dot. I'm not, the video is just what the video is. It's pictures, it's videos, dynamics of these penduli, okay? And from that data, what I want to learn is that it has to learn this coordinate system of theta theta dot, okay? And once it can learn that, then it can learn the governing equations. And in fact, that's exactly what Kathleen's architecture does. It allows you this framework to go straight from some kind of proxy measurement, which video is perfect, right? Because that's so easy to get from a data acquisition point of view. Film your physics. I like to think about it. It's like we're in the world of GoPro physics, right? You just go take a GoPro camera, film some physics. From that film, can you do something like this? And at least the stuff that Kathleen did is setting up a framework which allows you to find coordinates and dynamics jointly in this structure. And more recently we've done is taken it one step further, which is, yeah, but what I really want to understand is as I have data from different parameter regimes, how do I learn parametric representations? So we can take that same architecture that Kathleen had, and this is work with Mano Kalia, is what we said is, hey, let's work this into, we know from a lot of our physics background that there's these canonical normal forms for instabilities. And I give you four of them right here, right? So oftentimes when parameters change, systems become unstable, you get different kinds of onsets of patterns or instabilities. And so if you go back to work of Cross and Holberg in the mid nineties, they really laid this all out in terms of pattern formation and pattern theory. And there's very specific type of instabilities that occur generically across almost every, every discipline. And so what we wanna do is take that body of knowledge around that kind of parametric, parametric dependence that we see in spatial temporal systems or dynamical systems and embed that in directly into our architecture. So what we're gonna do now, instead of running a representation, we're running a parametric representation in terms of a normal form. So the coordinate system now doesn't just embed me with the parsimonious dynamics, the coordinate system embeds me on a normal form, okay? So this architecture of coordinate discovery with model discovery, right? I'm showing you, you can do linearizations of Koopman, you can find governing equations, you can find normal forms. All of this is possible within a very simple architecture in some sense, right? Which is learn a coordinate and then force some kind of interesting advantageous constraint on the dynamics inside of that. The other piece of this is just learning also, this goes to a question that was asked for George, which is what about uh, you know using this in sort of a data simulation common filtering way? Well, the other part of this that's really nice is you can also embed known physics into this, right? So a lot of the physics problems we have, we actually know quite a bit of the physics. So for instance, suppose I know some physics, it's just that my model is not good enough to represent the truth. I need to learn the discrepancy. In other words, learn the missing physics. And so in some kind of Cindy architecture like this, this is trivial. You just move the f of x to the other side. It's now part of the known dynamics. So I just, I compute the derivatives minus f of x, and then I regress to a library which could potentially describe that missing physics. And so it's a very easy architecture to build in. And where I think this really can play a role is in things like, robot, you know, this is like a CAD simulation of digital twins, right? So the idea is to take this CAD sim as a proxy for the real robot, but for high precision manufacturing, this model, which was based upon perfect physics is not good enough. 
So what we need to do is learn the difference between these. And this is what this data, this discrepancy modeling allows you to do is adaptively learn what is the physics I'm missing for the real robot so I could use it in real applications. So that's it. And uh, yeah, so there's this neural network. <laughs> Learn coordinates and then do interesting things in that coordinates and put all the pressure on that neural network to find you a good coordinate system. Thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, we have a question. Um, can you please comment on the impact of noise and systematic distortion in the data? Yeah, so noise is, all, we've been working very hard with the noise problem. When we first started, noise was a big issue. We can only handle a very little bit amount of noise um, it, before that regression, the Cindy regression, or even the linear models were very susceptible to noise. But one of the things that we've been starting to do recently is doing an ensembled version of Cindy and an ensembled version of the Koopman operator. And this works like magic. You just use bagging tricks out of statistics, right? I mean, this is old as the hills. It goes back to Bryman, right? Just, if you're having trouble, bag it. It robustifies things. And it's amazing how well it works in these contexts. Um, and this is, by the way, very recent. Um, I'm almost embarrassed to say we should have, why didn't we do that like when we first started this? But like, okay, we're a little slow. We got onto it finally. Um, but bagging is just an amazing, amazing trick with taking data and being able to robustify whether it's outliers or noise. Okay, thank you. Um, next question. Are there functions that cannot be discovered in this learning framework? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, let, me, let me make one philosophical comment on this. Clearly there are functional forms in that F, like discovering the dynamics that would be very difficult to discover. Like how would you know how to build this library term unless you already knew the answer, right? That, that's fair. But I think what the way we think about this is what we're really discovering is dominant balanced physics. So really this is our belief in the system is that F even has some super complicated form. When you observe it in practice, you know, it's, you're seeing in some sense, a Taylor expansion of that F to the dominant terms. And that seems to be how we actually have done physics. You know, for instance, when you throw a ball in the air, we model it with F equals MA. We neglect quantum mechanics. We neglect statistical mechanics. We typically neglect any kind of turbulent flows generated around the ball. But my F equals MA model is pretty dang good, right? I just look at one dominant balance term, which is gravity. And so we're kind of rely relying on that a lot here, which is the physics is clearly more complicated than what we're getting. But the hope is in more regimes where there's some dominant balance physics, where it becomes very difficult is things like turbulence, where you get this slow cascade of scales and <laughs> everything's mixed together. And that's, that's just a hard problem, as I think everybody knows, right? Turbulence is going to be around still another 100 years, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, okay. um, can this framework handle discontinuous changes? Or is it yeah, there's a, there's a hybrid formulation of this that allows you to build models and pieces. So what we did is we did, you know, like a good example is a pogo stick. You know, there's two dynamic states. There's when it's compacting on the ground and when it's airborne. And so you can actually set this up to automatically identify these regimes, build models in each one separately. Oh, okay. Well, thank you. Um, we should move.